Hey everybody, welcome back to X-Plane 11. I am Bill and today's video is going to be a little bit different. I basically just want to share with you guys my recent experience flying for the first time in real life in Southern California. I've been using X-Plane as a way to basically prepare for this and in the hopes of turning it into a private pilot's license. Uh, recently moved down back down to Southern California which if you may or may not know is a very unique general aviation location. Um, the, uh, I can, actually if you, I can pull it up right here. Here's the map and this is the X-Plane 11 map. This isn't even the, the chart, um, the actual VFR chart. There's just airports and nav aids and all kinds of stuff all over the place here. So it is very busy, it is very complicated and you need a lot of different types of skills to fly, like radar, uh, radio communication that you may not need as much in other, other regions. Um, there are some untowered airports around here, but for the most part, if you're flying out of one of the main airports, you're on a clearance frequency, a ground, a tower, SoCal departure, SoCal approach, tower, ground. So you're doing as many as seven um, radar you know frequencies in one flight um, plus or minus if you're flying to an uncontrolled airspace or an uncontrolled airport um, you know you won't have to go through the the tower ground again but basically it's very it's a very involved process um, recently I've been flying a lot on pilot edge which you can always join me live uh, twitch.tv slash bill Ferelli there will be a link uh, in the description and that has been instrumental in getting to the point that I got to this past weekend um, in relation to flying in real life so what I'm going to do is just kind of show you um, in the simulator what I did not the whole thing necessarily but at least the main parts of it and talk you through a little bit of how X-Plane helped me in the real world plane in the real world scenario um, so here's the plane it was a 172 Skyhawk um, similar livery to this and it was parked almost in this exact location right in front of the Newport Beach Land Rover Jaguar dealer so um, things that I that I have that might be different from your setup if you've got X plane or P3D or uh, flight sim I have the payware John Wayne scenery which is uh, what we're seeing here and I have the ortho overlay for the region which if you fly on pilot edge it's almost a necessity because it, it definitely helps with navigation in the air and it just looks real um, so this I actually have a picture of this plane in this location so um, Flying the 172, you know, most flight schools are going to have this plane, if not all of them. So getting familiar with your with this plane um, in X-Plane will help you uh, no matter where you end up flying, if you do end up flying, because the default plane in X-Plane 11 is the 172 SP. Most places will have a 172 variant, so... Um, Learning where everything is is very very easy and that was the first thing that I um, I realized when I got into the plane is how familiar it looked now this this was the second time I've been up in a, in a 172 within the last six seven months Which is a huge gap like but I have been in I have flown one, you know within a calendar year um, so not really connected to the the information that you can get from the sim because that was so long ago that I really necessarily wouldn't count it as kind of recency. Um, but when you're inside the the cockpit here, really the only difference is going to be what um, avionics you've got. Everything else is identical. So going around the plane when we're doing the pre-flight, which is the, the actual visual inspection pre-flight of the plane was the biggest departure from sim flying because 
Mm -hmm. One, you don't have to. I mean, there are definitely, um, you know, realism packs where you can do a full walk around. But, you know, get putting the flaps down and checking all the connectors in here, which, you know, you've got to do with the flaps down. You know, moving the ailerons up and down, checking the hinges, doing all that stuff, walking around, checking the um, elevator services and the rudder and making sure everything looks good, checking the fuselage, make sure everything's straight, checking all of the, let's see if I can actually, if they if they have it here, um, maybe not, um, all of the fuel, there's like little, yeah, it's not going to show it here. They're just little holes that you, you basically check the fuel to make sure there's no water in it and that it is fuel. It's like a light blue tint. So all of that stuff was great learning experience um, and definitely a different thing that you can't really replicate in the simulator. But once we get in the plane, everything was exactly where you'd expect it to be if you've flown or have any time in a simulator and in particular X-Plane 11 with this default 172. This is with no add-ons, you get this plane. And my experience flying in this made it so easy to just hop in the plane and know exactly where everything was. So I'm going through the checklist, checking everything off. Um, you know, you got the master on, you got the, you want the beacon on first, checking the actual, the fuel selector. Um, when you are, when you shut it down, you want to set it to the right tank. So switch it over to both. You've got the fuel cut off, you know, so you make sure that that works and we want to put that into both. Come on. Um, and just going down that, that checklist and making sure that you've, you've done everything correct. Um, but knowing where everything is makes that time, um, you're not wasting any time. So if you have never been in this plane before, you have no idea where anything is, the instructor is going to have to tell you, okay, the avionic switch is below your, you know, above your right knee and click it. And so when you have the experience and the knowledge of where all these things are in the sim, it makes it that much quicker to pick it up. So when you do have the engine running, you're not wasting any of that valuable time with the engine on. Um, you know, when, when this, this Hobbs meter is, is clicking away, you're getting charged. And if you are trying to learn where all these buttons and everything are, it's wasted money. So what we did is, and I'll just get this thing started up real quick, just so we, hey. Okay. Yeah, and a gyro. This thing has been goofy. I don't know why it's been resetting every time. Um, so yeah, anyway, so got the plane started. Um, the windows don't open on this default thing, um, but you know, we have the windows open and it looks just like this. I mean, you, they do such a good job in this simulator of shading everything and everything is placed exactly where it should be. Uh, let's get the avionics on here. So the avionics package that the plane I flew had was definitely not this dual um, Garmin setup or you know fake Garmin setup. So there was a Bendix King GPS that was a smaller version of what the 430 would be, but we did have. Um, two dual band radios or comms so we're sitting here and we're doing all of the checklist stuff and since I've been flying on pilot edge I have done this flight over and over again and again if, if you want to see some live pilot edge flights twitch.tv backslash Bill Forelli link below and I also have posted a couple other videos as well if you want to check those out. Um, some, some past videos of my learning curve, which was a pretty steep learning curve. But I am su super, super thankful that I went through all of that because it made this seem like a piece of cake. It's, it's unbelievable. So um, basically dialed up 
the ATIS and I got the ATIS information. So that's um, 1260. So you just dial this up. Orange County. Get the John Wayne. Skyline. Information echo. Information 2, echo. 2200 Zulu weather. Wind calm. Visibility more than 10. Sky conditions 20,000. So you go through all that and it sounds very similar to that and you can actually call up your, your local airport and uh, if you go to Sky Vector and you, you select an airport that's nearby, um, a lot of them will have an ATIS that has a, a dial-in phone number. So you can call up and you can get the live ATIS for the airport, um, for any airport, and, and hear exactly what it sounds like in real life and you know even use that to practice in the simulator you can just call it up and get the actual weather and give pilot edge the real weather if you've got real weather on you know it might it might vary a little bit depending on what information uh, this your sim is gathering but you could do that so you can get the actual ATIS um, before you you do this uh, to prepare um, then I go over to clearance which is 118, and we had all these dialed in ahead of time. Um, we had the two ground frequencies on the, I think it was the bottom and then the top, we had all the in-air frequencies. So there's 118.8, flip over, and I'm not connected to the pilot edge, but just, just as an example of what, what I said, um, John Wayne clearance, Cessna Skyhawk, 363 Sierra Papa with VFR request. And there was some chatter back and forth. We kind of had to wait, and he said, you know, 360 Sierra Papa, go ahead with request. Looking for Newport departure uh, down the coast to Dana Point. That's kind of all we said. So he came back with exactly what they say in Pilot Edge, identical. It was, I had listened to it 100 times. Not really, but it feels like I had listened to it 100 times. And his... His uh, departure um, procedure was fly heading 150 at or below 2400 feet, departure frequency. The departure frequency was a little bit different, but in Pilot Edge they used 128.1 and squawk whatever the number was. I can't remember what, what our uh, transponder number was. So I read that back. I wrote it down just like I do in Pilot Edge. I read it. I have, here's my notes as well. I don't know if you can, if you can see that but I just have this notepad next to me. Um, the one I had in the plane was much smaller, but I just write that down and I have it next to me um, and it was on my knee board in the plane and I read it back. I said, departure heading 150 at or below 2400 feet. Departure frequency 128.1, squawk 4063, 363 Sierra Papa. Read back is correct. Once I get read back is correct, I said, um, I, I think I just announced going to ground. So once that's done, we've got clearance, and then I go over to ground, which is John Wayne actually has two ground frequencies because it's a larger, busy airport, so there's an east and a west ground. So I'm on the east side, so we were on 120.8. There is the east ground, and that in, and then we got um, all this stuff on, put in the parking brake, and now we were we were rolling and this is where it starts to feel a little foreign is when that that first taxi um, the flight that I did about seven months ago I didn't do much of the taxiing so I didn't get a chance to get a good feel for it and it, it takes getting used to I mean the, the torque of the propeller is pushing you to the left and you're it is not um, it's not easy to stay straight so we pull up here and, you know, we just kind of check, you know, we're checking around, making sure that coast is clear. Uh, John Wayne ground, this is Cessna 363 Sierra Papa at Dove Street parking with taxi request. Uh, Dove Street is the name of the parking and that is one thing that is very difficult to learn in the simulator is some of the particular nuanced um, locations at your, your local airport. So. Dove Street is actually this street right here and it kind of there's a little there's a light here and it goes straight into this parking lot 
So this whole parking area is referred to as Dove Street. I didn't really have a name for it before. I just kind of was calling it, um, you know, OCFC or East Southeast Ramp or whatever. Um, so that's something that is kind of difficult to know unless you actually are with your CFI who's telling you, hey, they, they like to hear this. They know what Dove Street means. So they um, they said, you know, uh, you know, go for taxi clearance. And um, we wanted um, clearance to taxi to the midfield run-up. Again, this was another thing that was... Um, Something you can only learn if you've got a CFI with you is some of the particulars of the of the airport. So we got clearance via Alpha to the midfield run-up. In all of my Pilot Edge flights before the real flight, I was going to the southeast run-up, which you're going to see coming up right here. For no reason other than the the airport chart that I was using only showed the southeast run-up. There was no midfield run-up marked on the um, on the airport. So here's the southeast run-up. This is where in all my pilot edge flights I used to pull in to do the run-up. So we got clearance to the midfield run-up which is past the compass rose here. I don't know if this compass rose shows up on the default scenery in Edge on Wayne but um, it's it's impossible to miss in real life so we got ta uh, you know clearance via alpha so we say you know taxi to midfield run up via alpha 363 Sierra Papa and we taxied over here there was another plane doing a run up um, next to us right here and I'll tell you that taxing in this air at this airport is so amazing we were there was a can't, I don't know exactly what type it was, but there was a corporate jet behind us and a big 737 coming off the runway, um, you know, to zero right to our left. So it's like immediately you're you're thrust into this super busy, crazy environment. Um, you know, and this with this is my second loggable hour, um, and it's overwhelming, but very cool. And also something you can't replicate in a simulator because there's a 737 coming at you, and you know despite how great pilot edge is, they can't really um, replicate some of the stuff that you know the traffic and the busyness of a of a real uh, airport. So we did our run up, um, which was you know very simple in this plane. You know we just crank up the RPMs and check the mags, which you know. Listen for the, the drop in RPMs, all that. Obviously much slower. I'm just kind of going quickly through here. And um, then we were ready to go. So we were stayed on ground, and it was a simple call of uh, John Wayne Ground, uh, Cessna 363 Sierra Papa, ready at midfield run-up. And that's all you got to say. And they just, you know, taxi to 20 left via Alpha and kilo so usually I would come around when I was uh, doing the run-up at the southeast entrance I'd go Alpha Hotel Charlie kilo so this one was was actually much easier because and this was again a local native knowledge kind of thing so I just go straight on to Charlie so it made the procedure that much easier I, don't, I didn't have to worry about that left at a hotel and Charlie you know messed with Alpha only getting to the run-up and then straight on into Charlie for two zero left. Again, it was super cool to have um, all the planes lined up here, and this scenery pack does a really good job of showing the proximity and you know the fullness of uh, the terminal here. It looked like this, I you know exactly. Um, there wasn't a little sob over there, but all these planes lined up it looked exactly like that um, so much busier than pilot edge much much busier than you know like probably world traffic would either be even be um, so it it's hard to replicate that 
but you're on the the radio with them and it's it's a very comforting safe feeling to be on the radio with them so then we switch over to tower and tower is 119.9 we had this already preset and i'm glad i'm wrong okay so now we're on to tower and john wayne tower Cessna 363 Sierra Papa holding short runway 20 left at Kilo and they've got us so we went to hold short oops let's get the flaps down the flaps actually are not that loud at all they they're super loud in X plane 11 in this plane but um, you've got the headset on and the engine noise drowns out that little electric um, flap. So we got instructions to line up and wait. I don't recall why. I'm trying to think if there was a reason why. But um, anyway, so we were told to line up and wait. And we're flying and hitting uh, 150. And this is super wrong. Um, so we were given uh, clearance to take off, and it says, you know, Roger that, clear to, clear to take off, and full power. This is another sensation that you can't replicate in the simulator. Um, airspeed is alive, we are rotating at 65, pull out your flaps, go up, flaps coming up fly a little bit out basically to the end of the runway and then turn on to our 150 heading and this was the exact yeah this is weird this is exactly what it looked like um, and in fact I'm gonna do something real quick that's gonna help with some of the some of the pictures probably um, my wife was in the back seat taking pictures and this was essentially her <laughs> this was her view out of the out of the plane here so we'll just get we'll get those locked in there um, so we were at or below 2400 feet and I was you know holding about a 600 feet per minute climb uh, 150 heading, just holding it, looking around for traffic the whole time, busy airspace, but we're, we're on their radar, they're, you know, we're under flight, we have flight following at this point, and it was a piece of cake. So we maintained this heading here um, until we got a little bit further out to the coast, and then we switched over to um, SoCal departure. Uh, pilotage uses 128.1, and we used. I don't remember exactly. I have the I have the sheet, but it was like 132 something. But anyway, we had that already ready to go. So when we were on tower, we just switched it to SoCal departure, and all you got to do is tell them your location. Excuse me. Tell them your altitude. And that's that's it. So SoCal departure, Cessna 363, Sierra Papa at 1,000 feet and climbing. And that's it. And SoCal departure contacts you and says, we got you on radar. And, you know, where are you going? We're heading down the coast to Dana Point. And she advised us that there were three other, three other planes um, heading down that way. She asked what our altitude was going to be. We said 3,500 feet. He says, "Okay, that should be that should be fine. Um, you know, we'll let you know if you know. We'll let you know where the traffic is. Super nice, conversational. It was it was crazy, but this was kind of the point where I felt it getting. It was it was weird. Um, you have a bunch of different sensations." Um, it's you know you're in the plane so it's kind of a you know a cramped feeling you're not in your your office space um, you know or a big room it's noisier there's vibration you've got 
you know, G loads on your body, um, you know, the trimming the plane, you know, we were kind of testing to see where it was trimmed at and I had a bunch of pressure on the stick and I kind of let go, you know, the instructor told me let go to see where it naturally was going and the nose pops up kind of like that and you get, you know, it's, you get those positive G's in your stomach and those things, again, cannot replicate in a simulator, not even in a motion simulator, really, um, but especially not when you're just sitting at your desk doing it. But everything that I was looking at and everything that I was doing, I understood completely. And I had done it before and I was comfortable with it and it was not scary. And when I look out the window, I saw that. And I saw that exactly how it appears here. Exactly. And this ortho scenery is really fantastic. The water was different. The, you know, the shoreline looked really nice. But this was identical. And flying, you know, knowing ahead of time kind of what route I was going to be taking, um, flying on pilot edge, knowing what I was going to be hearing, what I was going to be saying back, what it looked like, what all the numbers were. You know, I'm going to be doing roughly 100 knots. I'm going to be at 2,000, you know, 3,000 feet. All these instruments all look the same. You know, the heading bug was there, which, by the way, that heading bug, you push it in and turn it, um, which you don't on this. You know, you just you just turn it. So I went to turn it at first and realized that you had to push it in in order for it to actually move around. Um, but this that's what it looked like right there. I mean, just that's that's it. So what I was realizing at this point in the flight is, holy crap, I am prepared for this 100%. Like there, there was some some doubt going into it. Are all of the other sensory, um, you know, overloading of the G forces and the noise and the temperature? You know, is it going to be hot? Is it going to be cold? Is it going to be vibrate-y? Uh, you know, what's the headset going to be like? You know, I've got this headset, which, by the way, thanks to Rosewill and Newegg for this headset. This is the Nebula um, RGB headset. I love it. I don't have a standalone mic yet. But even if I did, this is more similar to an aviation headset. Um, so I keep using it. So even this sensation was um, nothing really that new. But this is exactly, exactly what it looked like. And there was even a, a house that I noticed. I wonder if I can see. It was a big freaking house. Maybe down more over. Yeah, I think it was that that compound right there. It was insane. Um, but this is what it looked like. And here's Dana Point out here. And other than having traffic, and there was a couple of things that we did, you know, traffic avoidance. We were at 3,500 feet at one point, and we got asked if we could go up to 4,000 feet because there was some traffic that was basically at our altitude. I could see him cross right over our nose, and I contact SoCal Departure. SoCal Departure 363 Sierra Papa has traffic in sight to our at, at our 12 o'clock low, and she just says, you know, 363 Sierra Papa, thank you. You know, are you able to go to 4,000? So it was like conversational. It was that they were actually nicer than than in pilotage, and I don't really know why that is, or even if that is something that's shared, you know, I thought that's shared by other people. But I, I did feel like it was a lot more conversational, um, even though there was a lot more going on, which was kind of interesting as well. The Pilot Edge controllers are definitely way more overloaded with work than the real life um, controllers are for different areas. So you might be... Uh, you know, John Wayne ground, and you've got planes coming in and out all over the place, taxiing, and it's busy, 
but it's all the same airport. The Pilot Edge guys have multiple airports that they're controlling, and that can get really confusing. So I don't know if that's it or not, or if I'm just making that up, but um, yeah, this is exactly what it looked like. And even like a little bit of the turquoise there. Oh, there's that, there's the house right there. I don't have a picture of it, but that thing was insane looking in real life. This does not do it justice at all, but that was crazy. And it's actually crazy that I can see it in here. Again, I mean, like I can do this flight in real life, come back to the simulator and still have fun going, oh yeah, I saw that and there's that. It's spot on, it's absolutely spot on. So next we went um, over Dana Point and we started to head up I-5 and I'm going to skip ahead and talk to you about the next portion of the flight, which was crazy. So one second. Okay, so let's see if I can articulate what happened next. And this, this is pretty cool. So one of the things that the uh, instructor asked even before we took off is where we live. And I'm actually gonna maybe get this, this on the pilot on here, just, just so I can kind of explain this a little bit without uh, getting too all over the place. So, before we, we took off, he said, hey, where do, where do you guys live? Um, because he wanted to fly over our house. To see if it was possible to fly over the house. It, it sounded like it was something pretty, pretty standard that they're used to doing for someone that's going on a, you know, what's essentially a demo flight. So I told him where we live. You know, we live in Orange, and it we're right underneath the approach for the big boys. And I, I said big boys and he thought that was super funny and kept referring to him as the big boys. So we were, we're at 3,500 feet, which we're not at now, but just for the, the sake of um, demonstration, I guess. Maybe we can go, we'll go, we'll go up a little bit, turn this off. So we're at 3,500 feet, and we're flying basically right up I-5. And he's, you know, telling us, hey, there's I-5, and um, by the way, El Toro looks, is like, does not look like that anymore. It's like totally a mess now. But um, so we fly over El Toro, and we're on with SoCal Arrival. We had switched over to SoCal Arrival a little bit past Dana Point. And since our house is underneath the approach, he called and asked for approval for an ILS approach. The ILS 20 right was the approach that he asked for, um, still VFR, but he wanted a, a VFR ILS approach clearance. Which, to be honest, I didn't know was a thing, um, but we got approval for it. And you know, he had asked because if we got approval for that that arrival, it would have taken us over our neighborhood. Maybe we could see our house. So I was not expecting to actually do the entire approach, but we were given approval for the entire approach which I flew the entire ILS approach. It was so much fun. Um, he's a, you know, obviously he's instrument rated um, as a CFI, but it was kind of, to him, it was boring because they tell you exactly what to do. So just to kind of give you an example, I don't know exactly what the, the headings were but this is essentially what, what happened. So let's get up to 3,500 here. And I'll, I'll put it on the, the autopilot just so this, this stays um, where it should be. Okay, so there's heading 
there's altitude, there are the blimps. So right now we're at 3,500 feet. We're dropping a little bit because apparently the autopilot is annoying when it's doing that. And the airport is right here. So we had this really cool kind of flyover of the runway, of the airport, right over the approach. So we're at 3,500 feet, we're well out of the way. Again, this is 3,300 feet for some reason. Um, and it was cool, I, you know, we, we saw a couple of jets come, like some smaller corporate jets coming behind us, but we're coming up, you know, basically the five here. So it was I-5 coming up right here. And here is the 55, excuse me, here's the 55. And this goes right by our house. So this neighborhood right here is where where we live. So we're kind of going in that direction. And I still, because we were getting vectors for this approach, I didn't know where exactly we were gonna be going. So we're flying at, you know, I, I think it was, it may have even been 300. So let's just go to heading 300. So I moved the heading bug Two three zero zero, and just kept flying. We're on on the radio with arrival, and still flying. My wife's back here taking pictures and you know trying to get some pictures of our neighborhood, taking pictures of the airport a little bit, like that, um, and basically just flying and holding that altitude, holding this heading and just flying flying straight and this is kind of where he's like hey this is you know this is a little bit boring you know he actually even ap apologized a couple times like yeah sorry this is so boring i was like you know this this is not boring this is really cool this was not something i was expecting to be able to do um so it was it was very cool for me um to be getting instructions from SoCal um, arrival and executing those um, those heading changes and, and vectors. So that was it was cool to me. And let's see if I can match this up. So you have right here. I don't know if this is going to be it yet. One thing that. The, the scenery doesn't do is it doesn't have a lot of contrast. Um, there is a, a lot more contrast in real life, but we're just a little bit further here. This is this is going to be pretty funny. So not at the exact angle, but. This is essentially where where we were. So I'm just going to pause this pause this here. And this is the picture here that my wife took. So there's the picture and you can kind of see the freeway, the, you know, I5 on the bottom here running um, running across the screen and then you can just kind of see the interchange here maybe a little bit a little bit more. So there's the uh, 57-22-5 interchange. Yeah, I, I paused it too early. So here's the here's the five here, and this is more SoCal geography than you probably care to have. But um, this kind of gives you an indication or an idea of of how um, how cool this is as a practice tool. So this picture um, shows Angel Stadium out there, which you can see. You got the 57 going straight north, and you've got the five kind of running running diagonally there. And you know, if you just flip back and forth, you can see that if you if you fly in this simulator enough, um, and go and do this in real life, it's not too far off. It really, it's really not. Uh, not bad.
So we are flying straight and Disneyland is right over our nose and I haven't been able to find it really on the simulator. They don't, it's, it's much easier to see in, in real life. Um, I don't think they really even have it here. Um, so we are flying here and then we basically, we got another vector. So it was, you know, 330 or 310 or something. It was um, a pretty minor change. And we're just flying this route and this is my neighborhood here. So it was, you know, we're basically at this point realizing that we're circling um, our neighborhood, which was awesome. Um, and we kept getting vectors. And I'm, I'm just guessing at what the vectors were. I don't remember exactly what, what we were being told. But I'm just kind of using some of the land, landmarks here to make these turns. This will, this will be a good one. Okay. Okay, I don't think that's quite it. Almost. Part of me showing you this is because it's just kind of cool. Um, you know, it's a good demonstration, I think, of what X-Plane can do, graphically speaking. Um, but it's also just kind of fun to try to, to try to match these things up here. Is that pretty close? It's, we're almost, almost there. Okay, I'm gonna kind of uh, maybe let it go a little bit more. Let's get that peak in the back there. Okay, so that's pretty pretty close right there. Um, not exactly. I think we're a little bit closer than we were. Um, obviously not three dimensional, but you can see. You know, you got the freeway here, 57. Again, not much contrast here. Um, oh, sorry, 57 here. This is the uh, this is the river, um, and it's just identical. I mean, the sight that you get out of the the window is exactly what you experience in the simulator. Exactly. I mean, some of the the reflections are different, and the lighting is different in real life, and you know, you're obviously not going to replicate. 100% real world uh, views, but for a simulator, I mean that's that's pretty pretty close right there. <laughs> that's pretty freaking close. Um, God, that is so so cool. I'm kind of looking at these pictures again for for the first time. Um, I mean that is pretty pretty damn close to the real thing. That's awesome. Absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, right right there. That's pretty pretty good right there. <laughs> Contrast is not there um, in the sim, but and obviously a lot of it's flat flattened, but at this altitude, you know, a lot of it is flattened anyway. So I'm going to uh, skip ahead here again and get to the good stuff. Okay, so a little bit further further down, um, we got to this point, which is, I mean, this, this is my neighborhood right here, all this. So we were, we were trying to find out, you know, like try to look for our house, and you can technically see it just because it's everything's a grid, so you can kind of go, okay, well, there's that street, two over, it's somewhere in there. Um, but we really didn't see the actual house. Um, but you could see everything from up here. I mean, it was, you could see Corona, you can see uh, Chino, um, almost Riverside out there, Ontario's out here, you could see all of them. 
So then we got um, vectors to, uh, let's see if I can remember what what it was. I, I want to say it was like 170 was the, the direction. I think it was 170. It might not be right. But, um, you know, we're, we're cleared for the ILS, ILS approach. Yeah, this this looks this looks about right. So we yeah we turned. I mean we're f like it looked a lot closer in the plane, but we're heading towards these mountains essentially. And I'm like, this is where you got to trust that they're gonna come on the radio and say, okay, turn, because um, we were pretty close to to these mountains over there. But um, so the ILS has a frequency. Now I'm I am not a instrument pilot obviously, and I'm not really even an aspiring instrument pilot. Um, but there's different approaches you can do. So you, you've got the procedures here, so you can do select arrival and you can, you know, dial in in a GPS exactly what approach you want to do. And some of them are RNAV, some of them are GPS, some of them are ILS. So we did the ILS approach. I actually don't know what the hell any of that was. I think that's for Riverside, but, um, so the ILS frequency is 111.75. So I dial in 111.75 in the navigation. So I just flipped over here, dial in 111.75, stuck it in there, um, made sure that we were not in GPS. So VLOC was selected. And it is two zero right. So basically you dial in the frequency on this little majigger. Um, and this is the instrument. This is the, the actual approach. Um, I don't know. The, I don't know the terminology. I was not prepared to do this. Um, and I still don't, I mean, I know what that is and I know how it works, but I don't know exactly what it's called. I think it just called an ILS instrument landing system. Um, so, we had that dialed in and set up on 20, 200, which is the, the runway heading. And then I was given, uh, you know, told by approach to fly heading 170 and intercept the, uh, um, oh my God, help me. Fly 170 and intercept the localizer. There we go. So here's 170, and I need to intercept the localizer. I'm going to get this off here. I'm a little high. So fly heading 170 and intercept the localizer. So I might be a little bit too far over. Yeah, I'm a little too far over. So I, that one I do remember. It was 170, but I'm going to come out a little bit further because... It's not lining up exactly the same way. And in fact, I'm going to go here because I do recall being over a little bit more towards the mountains. It's kind of over here. Let's, let's try that. Um, yeah, that's a little bit better. Yeah, because we were pretty close to those mountains. That, that looks a lot, a lot more like what I was seeing. Um, so intercept the localizer means basically a lot of you, this is, I'm probably saying this wrong, but to my understanding of how to fly an instrument approach, um, I'm flying until this line line up, oh, then see, there it goes. It starts moving to the right. So you turn on to that little needle. And it's going to line you up with two zero right, which is right right there. Now I'm a little bit um, left of the the localizer, but I am on the glide slope. So the horizontal needle shows you the glide slope, and the vertical needle shows you where you are on the localizer left and right of the of the runway. So once you've intercepted 
that. Once this is totally vertical, you've now intercepted the localizer, so you've got to be heading towards that localizer. Um, it was much easier to see the runway as well. The, the contrast was, was much better. So, we were about this far off, you know, about four mile final, and we get the instruction from the, uh, I think we were on tower by this point, to fly best speed. So I was actually doing 140 knots, trying to stay ahead of the traffic. Because we were flying the big boy approach, I had big boys behind me. So there were a couple of jets that were coming in. So we had this thing pegged, nose down, kind of going up and down on the glide slope. I wasn't great with it. Um, but not too bad. He was actually, he was pretty impressed. Um, and I'm very high. So it takes some getting used to is you are the dotted line. The glide slope is the needle. So you're not the needle. It's you're, you're the thing that's not moving. The glide slope is what's moving. So when the needle is below the dotted line, that means you're above the needle or you're above the glide slope. So there we go. Now we're on the glide slope, doing a buck 40, s just screaming along, lined up for two zero right. There was a 737 holding short of runway two zero left, which and actually I've got, my wife took this great video coming in for landing and you can see the 737 taken off. It was pretty wicked. So he was lining up and waiting and we got to about here and we needed to start slowing down to get the flaps down and actually like configure the plane for for landing. So we pulled the power almost all the way back and it was like right around 100, 100 knots. We got the first notch of flaps in. And then it was right about here, right as we were crossing over the 55 freeway, which is right here, we were told to move over to 20 left. So we basically got down to, uh, you know, I, I don't know, like a thousand feet or so, and we were told to move to 20 left. So we confirmed over the radio, moved over to 20 left, and then we saw that. 737 start to to line up and wait there and the localizer gets all screwed up everything you know this this just goes kind of because you're now moved way over because the localizer is for or you know that ILS approach is for 20 right and now we just moved over to 20 left and the closer we got the the more off of the the localizer we became and then it started to get really really bumpy it was a bunch of roads a bunch of buildings it was a hot day so there was a lot of heat and a lot of updraft coming up so it was like I mean we we're I was working to keep that thing straight I mean it was it looked like this I mean I'm it's bouncing all over the place and right about here is when I start thinking holy crap this is different than the simulator and I mean right right about here you're you're looking at a lot of stuff that you don't really get a good sense of seeing in the simulator so one these buildings those are 3d those you know that's fine but what kind of surprised me is the freeway and how freaky that freeway is with all of these street lamps and road signs and the trees and everything. It was just like all these, these hazards. So I had this, um, I felt like I wanted to stay higher than I probably should have. So if you can see right here, this is actually a pretty good indicator is here. We're according to the, um, the Pappy lights here. Um, we're high and here 
if you if you're just looking at you know like the street signs and the lamps and the freeway that's about like I wouldn't want to be any lower but you got to get a little bit lower and it is a super unsettling feeling when you're doing this in real life and you've got a 737 right here you've got a bunch of jets taxiing over here you've got all this stuff happening and you're trying to focus on staying on the glide slope staying on the center line being you know not being freaked out over the, the street lamps you know making sure you're at the right speed get the flaps down here I mean like right right here um, you know it's just like there's freaking 405 it's one of the busiest freeways in the country um, just right there it's a, it's a total trip for your first time I mean you could you definitely obviously get used to it but whoa apparently that flaps going up or going down tweaked it out um, you know and right here you can kind of get get back on it but then you know you're you're dealing with turbulence and you've got you know probably jet wash coming and that was actually probably about the kind of landing I did um, that part you just got to practice I just have to go up and I got to do you know pattern work you know at some other airport and just get used to the you know what it feels like landing a particular airplane um, so you pull off here you stop you get ground you get clearance to taxi to back to Dove Street and you head back so it was about an hour uh, beginning to end and it was just it was so surprising to me how um, comfortable I was with a lot of it obviously the landing is the big thing you know it's a big part of flying um, so I need to get better at that I need more experience doing that but everything else you can get the experience in a simulator and translate that into a by all accounts successful um, real-world flight and I'm, it, it was like a good vindication that what I was hoping I was doing by practicing on here um, was actually working. And it's encouraged me to continue to do this and, and start to add other aspects to the radio communications, the, the plane flight management, the, the flight planning, all of that stuff, um, you know, I felt like I had a lot more than just two hours worth of experience you know two loggable hours worth of experience and everything else will start to come so the you know the sensation of taxiing and, and taxiing straight and um, you know taking off and you know rotating and getting the plane trimmed immediately so it's you know the nose is not I'm not fighting to push it down um, all those things I'll be able to focus on in the real plane and not have to focus on making the appropriate radio calls so even not not to brag I'm just gonna sound kind of braggy but he said if if half of his student pilots were as good as me on the radio you know more than halfway through their their training he would be happy and that is really a testament to flight simulation, X-Plane in particular, obviously, um, and Pilot Edge. I mean, it. that service is absolutely freaking fantastic to be able to take someone who has never been on a radio in a real plane ever and be able to hop in and immediately start making radio calls. And actually, there were three mistakes on the radio, and all three of them were because of the CFI. And he told me that. He said, you were fantastic on the radio, and if it wasn't for me, you would have been perfect. The only mistakes were because of me. Now, um, how much of that is true, I don't know. I mean, I, there was definitely a comfort, a heightened comfort level with him being there, because I knew if I screwed up, if I didn't know what to say, I can always defer to him. 
which in piloted you can't. I mean, you're just kind of up there unless you've got someone in chat helping you out or, you know, a, a friend on Discord coaching you through things. You're, you know, you're not going to have that safety net. But the the experience that I got from Pilot Edge made it so easy to just hop in the plane and say, John Wayne clearance, Cessna 363 Sierra Papa with VFR request, and not be afraid of what I was going to get back or what I needed to say or what I needed to write down. All stuff that I practiced, all stuff that you can do within the comfort of your own office. And it's fantastic. So... If you've ever wanted to fly in real life and haven't yet, just call up your local flight school. Find the nearest airport, call a flight school, say you want a demo flight, say you want a, um, what do they call it, demo flight or, uh, you know, a tour even. There's one other term that I, I can't remember right now, but um, discovery flight. And go up. You know, it might be 100 bucks, might be 150 bucks or whatever. But you can be in the plane that you're flying an X-plane in P3D in FSX, and you can go up in real life and fly it around. And you know the instructor will let you fly it, and you know to whatever comfort level you're at. So I highly encourage you doing at least that. Um, and if you want to, you know, continue on to get your private pilot's license, which I am going to be working on doing now. Um, this has been confirmed to at least be a big help. Is it going to be the only thing that I'm going to need to do? No. Um, but the combination of this and Pilot Edge, I can be advanced to the point where I'm focusing on flying the plane and not... Um, worrying about where things are located on the plane or how to flight plan or what to say on the radios. I can get those things out of the way. I can get proficient at all three of those without being in the real plane. I can work on taxiing. I can work on landings. I can work on pattern work. I can work on feeling the plane and really focus on that and save a lot of time and a lot of money by getting all that stuff out of the way in a simulator. So for those of you that stuck around, thank you. Um, I really enjoy sharing this stuff. You know, none of this, none of what I, I put out there is really meant to be much of a tutorial. Um, it's really just a way for me to kind of force myself to talk through what I'm doing, have a little bit of fun. It, it is fun sharing this with you guys and all the comments I get back. Um, it's really helpful. I appreciate those of you that that do help me with things and say, hey, if you, you know mess with the prop a little bit you can get going faster or you know you're not supposed to um you're, or you're supposed to disconnect your gps approach on the g1000 at minimums and don't land with it stuff that is you know constructive um i love it and it's a testament to all of you guys that if you're watching this at this point you've you're into flying at some level um so thank you and this community has been fantastic, and I'm really excited to continuing to, um, you know, dive into this aviation thing using computers, using simulator and services like Pilot Edge, and combining it in with, with you know, ground school with with regular uh, flight school, and doing this hopefully in a way that's maybe not unique, but a little bit non-traditional. Um, you know, my, my dad, you know, took a completely different route learning how to fly. And, um, every time I tell him about any of this stuff, he's, he's totally shocked. So, um, I feel like this is a fantastic time to be entering in this hobby with all the, the stuff that we have at our disposal to learn and to be safer and to have fun and to do it, uh, cheaper, um, it's really fun. So again, thank you guys so much for all the help, all the, the feedback and the support. Um, you know, if you want to follow me more through this, um, links are below for whatever, um, you know, like my Twitch account. Um, if you're just into video games and you want to watch um, me and my friends, my coworkers play 
uh, Wednesdays and Fridays on Newegg, uh, twitch.tv slash Newegg at 2.30 p.m. Pacific time. We stream every week. Check that out. Um, but for all you aviation guys, thank you so much. Thank you for watching, um, and we'll see you next time. All right, guys. Peace out.